ice. Just trying to see how I can... Yeah, we've got a good bunch of people. I'll get started in a minute, because, you know, people have turned up on time. That's fantastic, so you don't want to waste your time. So, yeah, welcome to this workshop. It's great to have you here. Um, it's called Understanding Functions in R. And I'm hoping that... Um, yeah, I'm hoping it'll be a learning experience for people, obviously. Um, and I'm, it's, I'm intending, very much intending that it's not going to be uh, a lecture uh, from me, of you listening to me for an hour and a half. And um, we've got some, some code to, to work through, so it's slightly interactive. And at some point, certainly I'll be, um, you know, maybe dropping a question or two out to you and we'll hopefully have time to um, build a little bit of a function together and, and, and throw some ideas into the pot in terms of how that function would work. That, that's later on. Um, but yeah, for now, I think I think most people are here, so that's fantastic. So yeah, I'll get get moving. Hopefully my screen is coming through all right for everyone. And I, I'm seeing lots of Zoom notifications on my screen, but I'm hoping they're not on top of the slides for you all. Um, yeah, so some intentions for this morning then. You know, I want to get you writing some functions or at least running some functions that are already there in the code I've supplied. Hopefully you got an email from Bianca yesterday afternoon with a, a kind of instructions, if you like, if you want to download the Git uh, repository um, that I've made for the, the, the materials for this session, the instructions for that in the, in the email. If, um, if you're stuck on that and you want to do it this morning, uh, maybe just ask in the chat and hopefully someone else will give you a, a pointer on that but it's not essential um, but I kind of feel like it's nice if you've got some things to play around with um, during the session to, to join in so yeah we're going to be playing around with some actual R code and, and for, for me sort of there's a couple of motivations for the session really one was um, trying to help a colleague of mine with some some code a colleague who shall uh, remain nameless and I was looking through and I was thinking oh this would be so good as a function and that and they said to me, yeah, I tried to put it in a function, but I just couldn't get it to, to work. And I thought, yeah, there is something about writing functions and getting them to work that can be really tricky. And it took me back to just a, you know, a couple of years ago, two, three years ago. And I remember when I first tried putting things into, into a function, I didn't really know what it was. You know, what was I actually trying to do? What's, how does this work? What's the mechanics of it? And eventually I feel like I had a moment where it clicked for me and, and I got I grasped a couple of things. Um, I can't force that to happen for you this morning and I don't know where you're at, you know, um, but hopefully at some point that I feel like with functions, as with so many things with, with coding, there's almost like a click and suddenly one day you go, ah, I got it. So my ideal this morning would be that some people have that kind of moment um, and sudden, suddenly something makes sense. It's, it's a really an introductory level session this morning and my, my main worry is that it's all going to seem extremely obvious and easy and really boring for you all and <laughs> that you'll just say yeah thanks Fran that was um really basic and we didn't need it at all but um yeah I, I I suspect um hopefully there's a kind of a need out there and it's really great that so many people have, have come along I'm not going to get you all to do introductions and stuff if you want to post something in the chat and just say hi this is me um, um what you know a bit about where you work that'd be lovely we can all uh, learn from that and um one thing i did want to invite you to do actually at the start is if, totally for yourself not for me not to share really is you know think about what is it you've you've come here to, for this morning you know is there a particular question is there a particular um issue that you've been wrestling with and then maybe at the end of the session if that question hasn't yet been answered or if it has um, and you want to just let let me know that. Um, I'm hoping we'll be finished with the kind of content, if you like, by about 11. And I'm really happy to just hang on then for another half hour, just informal. If anyone just says, look, can you just go over that bit again? Or, you know, I, I didn't really get my question answered. That will that'll be fine. Um, yeah, so I, I'm Fran from, I work for Nottingham University Hospitals. And I just want you to feel safe this morning to, to ask questions and and try things out. I'm really happy to be interrupted if you want to come off mute and just say, look, you know, I didn't get that or slow down or speed up or whatever it is, that's totally fine. Um, I probably might struggle to monitor the chat as I'm going through. I'm hoping 
that, uh, that Zoe might help with that and, and also shower for something urgent. And before I move on then, just if anyone does have any particular things, uh, questions or concerns before I, before I sort of get started, if you want to shout up now, otherwise I'll, I'll press on. Great. I'm gonna I'm gonna take that as as we're all here and happy and yeah. Super. Oh yeah. So intended outcome. I hope that by the end of this morning, not necessarily straight away, but as a result of today, you'll find oh I can write my own functions, and you know some when they're useful, when you think oh that you know this would be a good case for turning this code into it into a function that you'll have be able to either you know, know where to look, know who to ask, um, or feel like, yeah, I can do that. And uh, we're gonna start off going through some code that's really, really basic and completely useless, but just to get this, the hang of, okay, how do we put a function together? What does it look like? Um, a couple of thoughts from me, what is a function anyway? Um, function arguments are one of the things that I really got stuck on. I um, found that was the thing that didn't click for me and, you know, different people have different mental models and it might be really obvious to you but for me I needed some I needed some time to work out what the arguments to the function do and I'll explain what that is when we get to it one of the really useful things about using functions as a as an analyst or as you know a data scientist whatever in, in your role is that quite often Without them, we find that we write quite repetitive code. And one of the really useful things that functions can do is help us to neaten that code up, make it more reliable and so on. We'll go through that towards the end. Um, and that's just right at the end, just a reminder of why these things could be useful. And then hopefully, as I say, a little bit of time for, for questions. I'm gonna switch over to our studio and you're welcome to join me too, or just watch. Hopefully that's still sharing and you can see my R Studio. Shout oh, out if not. Just, just your presentation slide. Uh, okay. I'm gonna have to stop sharing and share again. I think that's the simplest thing to do. Apologies. Oh yeah, because I was just sharing a particular window, wasn't I? Good job this is going on YouTube. Okay, hopefully you can see an R Studio now and hopefully the writing is, yeah. is big enough. If you've got awesome. GitHub, this will, yeah my little color scheme which is easy on the eyes hopefully so i've got a file um zero one underscore initial dot r open um to start with and i've got a fresh session so i've got nothing in my environment and so on and i was trying to think what is the shortest function it's possible to write <laughs> to create as it were um I, I came up with with this and this is um a function style is like a shorthand with a slash and two um, curved brackets and then some output. And I was thinking about that and I was thinking, well, that's actually not as short as it could possibly be. You could just have a, a digit instead of the two, because I think that's what one, two, three, four with a space, five, six keystrokes, and then a control enter to run it. And all it does is repeat the function back to you. So that's completely useless, but we did actually just that was actually a function. It's completely useless and it's lost now because in the same way that if I go into the sorry, console. Can yes, sorry. sorry. Yeah, sure. the console. Can you just make the text a bit bigger? Is that okay? Oh, sure. Yeah. Zoom in a little bit. Yeah. Is that a bit better? Try a bit more. Just let's go big. Let's go big. Let's go big. Okay. Ooh. I'm going to yeah. close that out. One more. Oh, okay. Go for it. I like that. Oh, okay. Thank you. When we did the test the other day, it was, I think it was, looked like it was going to be fine without that. No, I don't want people to struggle to read it. So hopefully that's a bit better. Thanks, Zoe. Yeah, that kind of thing, please do shout out. There's no point struggling on. Um, okay, so, you know, just in the same way as if I just type, I don't know, whatever, at the, at the console, a six, I enter it, it just gives me the same thing back. It's gone. I can't do anything with it. I was just said, yep. That's a thing. <laughs> um, so that function was useless. If we assign it a name, we can assign you know anything in R to, to a name in the environment, then 
like anything else in R, we can find it again. So that same function, we can now assign it and give it a name, basically echo nothing or a, a zero length character. And that's now appeared in our environment. So we can find it again. It doesn't do anything interesting, but at least we can now use it again. We can run it again. And now it gives us the output of the function. It gives us that empty character string, basically. We could, um, we could have asked it to give us anything really. So that um, backslash with two brackets is a shorthand and it only works if you've got a more recent version of R, which hopefully you will have um, R4.1 or later. And it basically means do a function. <laughs> it's just slightly shorter if you're trying to save um, keystrokes and characters for some reason. So we could do the same thing again, call it uh, something slightly different, echo nothing to, and this time use the function word instead of the slightly ugly, to be fair, I think, backslash system. And that's gone. We've now got an echo nothing to in our environment. And we can just check those are in fact the same thing because I can run identical on them. And that says it's true. So it doesn't really matter which one you use. But as I say, I was just playing around really trying to think, trying to think what's the shortest function you could write that's actually a function. If you can think of a shorter one, I feel like it has to have some content. You can't just do the <laughs> uh, backslash brackets. Like, I don't think that would count. Okay, so let's do something slightly more useful. Still pretty useless, but anyway, if we make a new function and we give it an argument, so that's like an input, we're gonna say, um, call it X, you can call it anything you like, um, really. Um, we're gonna make a new function called echo input, and it's gonna take whatever X is and just repeat it back to us, right? Really not very useful. There we go, echo input, now we can run it, but we need to give it something to work with. It's expecting an X. So let's just say we give it the number six. What's it gonna give us back? Should give us back exactly what we put in. Six, there we go. Hopefully you can all see that happening in the console. This is thrilling stuff. Um, but we could put anything in there, really. We could ask it to do the calculation of some other functions, you know, for example, from base R. Um, all the numbers from one to 10, what's the average of them? You know, and actually in that, you know, echo input is doing nothing here. It's purely repeating back to us what we, whatever we put in. Um, we could even ask it, okay, what does a different function look like? And so sample is a function in base R. I expect many of you've used it for getting a random sample. If you just give the function name without any brackets, it kind of gives you back the definition of the function. It's like the code that made that function in the first place. So what does, what does the code that makes the fu function sample look like? Again, the echo input here is kind of doing nothing. That's the function definition. We don't need to worry about it. Okay. Let's try setting um, a value in our environment. We're gonna create something called X and just give it the number five. If we try and run echo input, remember it's expecting some input. If we just try and run it without giving it that input directly, we get an error, okay? It doesn't, it's not happy. It, it tries to give you X, but it hasn't got any X to give you, okay? Um, but we can call in that value from the environment we've just created, that number five. We can say x equals x. What do you think is going to happen? Five. Brilliant. Okay. And this was, I'm sorry if this is kind of totally obvious to everyone, but it might not be. The important point here is that it can be really confusing when your argument is called the same thing as the object that you're giving to the argument. So if you're calling something in from your global environment, this value of X here, even though it's called the same thing as what it's called in the function, they're completely separate concepts. The X before the equals is a really separate concept from the X after the equals. If we do something slightly more tricksy, let's create something called Y. And again, highly fascinating, number five, and create a new function, multiply input. But strange, it's not very good practice. I'm only giving it one input. 
of x. It's only expecting one input, but then I'm asking it to multiply that by y. Okay, let's create that function. Control and enter. Okay, if I try doing multiply input with a six, I'm sure you can work out what it's going to do. It's going to give us 30. It's actually not going to error because it hasn't found y within the function, but then it goes and looks for it outside in your global environment. And I'm going to suggest that when we're writing functions, doing things like that isn't great, really. But it, R will be very forgiving. It will look for Y in the global environment. Why won't it look for X in the global environment? I wonder. Feel free to jump in if you want to <laughs> say what you think. Is it because you've defined it as a variable within the function, so it has to look for a variable object distinctly well, within that function, whereas outside, it's just a constant. Y can be anything, anywhere. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So within the function, it's it's X. It's kind of the X that it owns. It's very particular and it can't replace that with something from um, from outside by automatically. Um, yeah. So the X within the function means something very specific within the function. How, so, just yeah. to jump in there. It doesn't help me. So I'm guessing this also has to be a character with a function. You can't tell it that six equals five because you've defined your variable name as six it doesn't like digits as names we could try that though i think what you'll have to do is put it in back ticks it might work i'm hoping it will tell you that it's logically stupid <laughs> well i think when you make so if you try and use six as a um thing i think you're right i think that would definitely it's already given me an error in our studio it's saying you can't call it that we're going a bit off track, but I think if you put it in back ticks, and this counts for things like mm -hmm. column names in data frames, things like that, that kind of um, saves it from being treated. It's almost like turning it into a, it's turning it into a symbol, actually, but I think rather than a character. But basically, I think, yeah, it's allowed that. And then if I go uh, multiply and put two, oh, Hopefully we're gonna get six times six back. No, hold on. Yeah, we're gonna get, no, we're gonna get six times five because it's gonna times this input, this real six, <laughs> there's actually a number by whatever Y is, which exists in the outside environment. We should get a 30. Yeah, does that make sense? So it's not, it doesn't like a pure digit as a mm. name. R doesn't like that in any context, I don't think. It'll have to be back tick to be a symbol or quotes to be a character. I think that's a fair summary. Okay, thanks. Well, this is part of what I want to do this morning is kind of let's play around and see what, <laughs> what we can do and what works, because I think that's sometimes, that's certainly the way I work best is by breaking things and going, oh, that didn't work. Okay, why not? <laughs> okay, I'm gonna, I'm just switching between windows again now. Cool. So we wrote some really basic, completely useless functions there. Um, we've had a play with some arguments and we started to think, okay, there's a difference between what the variables kind of treated as called within the function and, and, and something that lives outside of it. Um, I was trying to think, well, what is a function anyway? And you can come up with your own version of this, but I sort of felt like, for me, it's like there's a task I want to achieve and I'm going to put that in a capsule it's like the encapsulation of a task. And, and later on, we'll sort of run through some of the reasons why that's useful. What's the benefit of doing that? But for now, I'm kind of feeling like it's, it's like we've put this task in a, in a, in a capsule and it's, it should have everything it needs to complete the task. Like if you were going on a space mission, you kind of need to have everything with you. Uh, that's what we're aiming for. So that's one way. Um, thinking about it and the argument so so the argument is like what you put between the brackets when you're calling a function you're going to give it some arguments depending on how the function is defined some functions don't need them some functions have got loads I think today we'll stick to one or two so these are the inputs the things you're supplying to the function and I again just being a bit strange about it but I kind of was reminded of Scooby-Doo 
uh, and there's the you know the baddie and the, the monster or whatever there's always under a mask and there's the dramatic reveal at the end of oh it was Mr whoever or what, under the mask all along and it's kind of like that function if you imagine that you are somehow inside the function and that x comes in um, you don't need to uh, the function the function in a way does the same thing no matter what you give it or it tries to do the same thing I don't know if that's any help whatsoever but it's almost like the x as it goes through the function is wearing a mask that says that says x whatever the argument's called if that's really confusing I'm sorry it's a bit backwards okay so my next little story is um this this random security guard that um I've invented called Fenella. I was trying to think of something that sounded a bit like function and I thought no I'll just call her Fenella. So she works at this big warehouse and her job is to stand outside the warehouse and check anything that's coming in that it meets the requirements. So um, you turn up at the, the, the warehouse which is like passing your data into the function you go okay I've got a parcel for you and she has to look at it and go does it have the right label on it? You know I'm, ex I'm only expecting X's today and, and, and has your parcel got the label X on it? If so, she'll let it come in. And if not, she'll say, no, sorry, not expecting that today. Okay, so we'll think, thinking about that. For now, there's job description, you know, these labels are kind of defined when you create the function. So when you write it, you think, okay, what does this function need? What am I gonna expect? What am I gonna accept? For now, it's kind of, Again, indulge me here. She's kind of outside the warehouse. She's kind of stood at the gate, checking what's coming in. She doesn't need to look inside the box yet. That happens when it gets inside the function, inside the warehouse. The contents of the box only really get dealt with inside. That's, that's a slight oversimplification, but whatever. What happens if you try to bring in a parcel that has an unexpected label? And you might jump to the answer there straight away, well, it's going to be an error, and I think you'd be right. What happens, I'm going to ask you to think about, what happens if you don't supply a box for a label that's been expected? So let's say we're expecting an X and a Y, and we only expect an X. Uh, we only supply an X, sorry. I wonder what's going to happen then. You might think we're going to get an error. We'll see. Slight trick question, that last one. Okay. Um, I really should just share my whole window instead of sharing a uh, screen instead of sharing a window at a time. Anyway, I'm going to go back to our studio and have a little play. I've just seen a comment in the chat about zooming in, but hopefully we dealt with that already. And it's more readable now. Yeah. Okay. So hopefully this is going to work. Um, back in our studio, we've got file number two open now. Um, all of that shorthand earlier, you know, forget about that. We're going to use the more standard format with uh, the full word function followed by the arguments within brackets and these nice braces, which just mean you can put more stuff into your function definition. Oops. And everything that's between those curly braces kind of counts as the content of the function. So thrillingly, we're going to create a function called divide, which takes two inputs and divides the first one by the second one. I did divide instead of multiply because it kind of matters which way around you put them. With multiply, you can get the same answer either way, right? Okay, create divide. Uh, Seem to work. Give it a try. We're going to give it a couple of numbers, three and four. 0.75. Hopefully no surprises there. Oh, do you know what I should do? Let's just do a quick restart, actually. Clear that environment. Bear with. My R is really slow to restart. Okay. I've got a little mascot when I start that wishes me luck and stuff like that. Um, okay, I'm going to create divide again because we just lost it. Got that. All still good. Okay, now let's put a Y in the environment. What's going to happen if we try and get it to use that object from the global environment? Oh, doesn't like it. Okay, because this time it's expecting a Y 
as an argument. If you remember when we did this before, the YN existed inside the function. So then it called it. When it's expected as an argument, our friend Fenella, the security guard, goes, uh, nope. So now what if we divide three by Y? Just to be clearer here, maybe I'll just do this. X equals three, Y equals Y. And we just use this, sorry if this is obvious, but we just use a single equals there. We're not trying to test if something is equal to something else. We're just saying this is this symbol gets given this value. So divide X and Y, Y equals Y. I'm hoping, yeah, basically same thing as we just did. Um, if we put them the other way around, we should get the reverse thing happening because now it's going to, yeah, one and a third. Because R will process the order and the arguments in the order they're defined. And I guess this is the kind of thing where you think, well, hold on, I've given it Y first. Yeah, but you've given it the value Y, which is four, and you've given it first. So it's going to treat that as X. That's the label on the box. Okay, hopefully with me, just shout, put something in the chat if it's like, what? Okay, Z. Let's get wild. Let's create a Z. And now we're going to divide three by Z. Simple as three divided by 12, a quarter. If for some reason, and this can happen, you, you kind of end up needing to supply arguments in a different order, then you can do that. But you will need to name them so that the function, so that R knows which value to apply. So this looks really messy now, but hopefully you're bearing with. We're going to say the Argument Y has got the value Z, and the argument X has got the value Y. And I'll give you a sec, just think about what you think is going to happen. What's Z? What's Y? What are the values we're supplying? Hmm, I'm going to work it out myself, actually. So Y is going to get divided by Z, and we should get a third yes. <laughs> I confused myself then. Let's do a different function, um, half. So let's say we create this and we, we tell it to expect an X and a Y, but in our function, we then just create a new, a new variable Z. Within the function, you can totally do that. And then actually what our output will be, it'll be the last thing we do in the function, will be X divided by Z. Okay, let's create that. So at this point, hopefully you're thinking, hold on, What's happened to Y? <laughs> Let's see. Okay. If we supply one value, we're going to, the function is going to treat that as X because that's the value it's expecting first. What are we going to get? Let's say six and we're going to halve it and we get three. So obviously it's using the value of Z that you've supplied. That, that Sorry, that not that you've supplied, that's already hard coded into the function. And we could end up doing something really silly like this half two is expecting some inputs, but actually in the code itself, I've made it so that it doesn't really matter what you give it. It's going to hard code those things to certain values and it's always going to give you the same answer because it's not going to do anything with your, with your inputs. Half two, and I can just run it now without any arguments. It actually doesn't need them. So, that, this is what I do. I just play around and say, well, uh, can I break it? Or if actually it didn't break, weird, why not? Okay, so running that, all it's going to do is do four divided by two all day long. Doesn't matter what you send. This is really silly. So at this point, we might as well not have any arguments at all if we're not going to use them. Um, what I'm trying to get at is really when we're writing functions, we want to try and keep those functions as pure as possible. So... It, the idea is that it will use every argument that it needs in some way, and it will only rely on its arguments. It will only rely on its inputs. And ideally we want it so it's not relying on stuff that's outside in the global environment, because that makes it um, you know, more, un more unpredictable, I guess. So the more you write some pure functions like this, the more robust your code should be. And just finally then, because um, this is something that can trip people up sometimes, it's totally fine when you're writing a function to um, set the default value for something. And this is, 
this is totally fine. It's completely different to what we just did with that silly half two function because the creating it as an argument means the user can then override it if they want to. Um, so for some reason, if you wanted to take two numbers, take the average of them and then um, multi multiply by itself or you know, multiply that to a certain power and exponent, you could create a function called mean power. And if we give it five and seven, hopefully it's gonna take the mean of those two numbers. And then by default, it's gonna raise them to the second power, so it's gonna square it. So we should get a 36, yeah, we got it. If I wanted to get a cube instead then, raise it to third power, I just add that three in as my third argument and the function will know, okay, that's, this is the power. I get six to the power of three. Okay, let me pause. I, I said it's not gonna be a lecture, but I've done a lot of talking. So um, yeah. hopefully that's sort of making some sense or raising some questions and, and, and folks are following along. Can I just ask a question? Yes, yeah, sorry, yeah. So where you had the half two function mm. and the X and the Y were set in the function itself, I tried to put in a new X and a Y and mm. it still gave me the original answer of two. It was still doing the sum of four divided by two. Yes. So if I yeah. do 10 divided by three, I still get two. So yeah. those are redundant because it just ignores it. Yeah, it kind of overwrites them really. It's whatever you put in, it will just say, no, actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to ignore you. X is four. <laughs> and because it's kind of hidden in the function, there's no way as a user you can override that. So it's a really bad function. <laughs> It's, like, it's completely pointless, but it's almost my extreme way of just saying, you know, you, you can set these things within the function if you, if you for some reason, you needed to. But it, it's almost it's almost the reduction to absurdity of like, yeah, it, the, the the definition within the function will kind of override what you give it. Right. That's good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Good. It's good to play around with it. Um, Jasper, do you want to come in? Uh, yeah, so a couple of questions, which you might come on to later or might be beyond sure. scope. If, you, if you're doing a function, does it have to be an object? So say you had quite repetitive cleansing of data frames. So can you give it a data frame and tell it you want to mutate some fields, add some stuff, get rid of your NAs, and sort of do all of that within a function? Absolutely, you can. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So this is really, you know, the stuff I'm doing here is very much toy examples. And, and actually, maybe it would have been better to have sort of real more real examples like a lot of the stuff we work with I guess in most of our work is, in our jobs is like data frames and stuff so yeah I'll do a little we'll do a little bit of that a bit later but yeah totally it, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to um, just use really simple bits of <laughs> numbers you know to start with but because because characters can be tricky but yes uh, you can take you can set your function up to handle lists data frames whatever you whatever you want it to, to do as it gets more complicated, I guess. Uh, second question is, so more yeah. philosophical. Is it better to have lots of small functions that work together or one big one that does everything? And at what point <laughs> does that just become a package? Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're a step ahead of me. <laughs> so it is a philosophical, it's a, it is a question. And I think there's an ongoing debate to some extent, it's a matter of style. We will, we'll, we'll we won't cover this in detail, but I was going to come to this later. So some people love writing really small functions that just do one job really clearly, do it well, and then patch those together to do something bigger. And I can totally see the benefit of that. Um, my, <laughs> I get blocked because I think oh, I've got to think of a name for all of these things. and I'm terrible at thinking of names. So yeah, sometimes it makes sense or sometimes people will prefer to chuck a lot of things together and put it into one function and you can have functions within functions so yeah it's a philosophical okay. question and yeah, yes it's yeah it's go on, a philosophy yes. <laughs> <That's one thing. laughs> um i like small functions because they're reusable yeah. so inevitably you've like you said in your cleaning data we're doing the same thing repeatedly and that data will you know like uh, removing uh blank rows so the janitor package has taken that removal of blank rows and made it a function, and then you can use it on all of your data. So think about reproducible analytical pipelines, get it in there. Yeah. You start off big, you start off specific, and then you kind of go smaller and smaller and smaller and go, oh, actually, that can be used over here. So it's a process. 
Sure. I've not heard of the gelatin package. Oh, it's pretty. Put, it, put it in the chat, Zoe. It's yeah, really yeah. Good. I'll it's exactly it's such a great point and, and and i think that's what i meant by the mask thing the scooby-doo mask it's like mm. here's a function that whatever you give it will do a certain thing to it and you can pass in this data frame or that data frame and it'll try and do this it's like i'm going to do the same task no matter what you throw at me but i, I think the mask thing might be confusing but anyway <laughs> okay let's get back to the slides Okay, so we've been through that. Yeah, so a bit like you were just saying, um, Jasper, so I had that picture of the space capsule before, but I kind of think sometimes, you know, uh, I see this a lot, I don't know if you see it. I think since the um, shops, supermarkets started charging for carry bags, sometimes you see that thing where someone's forgotten their bag and you see them leaving the shop with like stuff piled up in their arms because we don't want to pay 15p for a bag or we don't want to have another plastic bag. So we're kind of carrying all the stuff and I feel like, our code, our capital R code can sometimes be a bit like that in our work. Like we can just have a whole list of stuff that we're trying to do. It's like piled. And, and what a function can do is kind of wrap all that stuff up, put it in a bag and it makes it transferable, makes it portable, makes it kind of, you can give it a name, um, that kind of thing and, and, and do the whole thing in one go. So um, yeah, I, I think, I don't know what the seagull's doing there, but um Instead of your space capsule, if a carrier bag appeals to you more, then, then you might like that. And I kind of feel like those curly braces that wrap the function, the, the content of the function, I kind of think of those as like the, the handles of the bag and everything that's inside lives in that bag. So um, yeah, function can contain a lot of tasks. Is that your point, your question, Jasper? Or it can just do one task really well. And there's, I don't think we've got scope today to really go into necessarily the pros and cons of both of those. It can be personal style. It can be depending on what project you're doing, how big you make your functions, how long they are, kind of a matter for your, you and your own conscience. <laughs> and so we might disagree with them, but yeah. So like, if you've got code that looks like this, and this is not in a function, this is just lines in your script, you're going to go through one by one, run that line, wait for it to finish, run that line, wait for it to finish, bring in some other data from somewhere else. I don't know, I just invented this code, bind them all together, you can just chuck it all in the bag and say get data and it will you can literally just move it all within the function and it will just run all of those things for you one by one basically as long as they work so i'm assuming that when you source data input one you get an object called data one you know that's just just trust me on that um i, I really don't like sourcing things <laughs> but yeah you could if you want put it on a function you only have to run that function once to create it and then run the next line and you've got your data out. So it's kind of two hits on the keyboard or whatever you do to run your lines rather than seven, 10, whatever, however many lines of code you've got. And it's kind of got a nice name, you know, get data is a bit boring, but you think, well, okay, what do I need to do now? Okay, I need, first of all, I need to get my data for my, for my report, done, you know. So that's really, I mean, if I was going to sum up this whole, <laughs> this whole session in one slide, that's kind of it. You can just chuck it in the bag. Okay. Sometimes you hear people say, I haven't found this, gone and found the source for this, although I've, I've seen Hadley Wickham say it. Um, if you find yourself writing the same thing more than twice, so you're writing it for the third time, it's time to turn it into a function. And then I would add, if you find yourself using a function in more than one project, you want to add it to a package and all the packages is like a a bigger carrier bag <laughs> it's like the boot of your car with all the plastic bags in it and again packages then really enhance that portability for of stuff from place to place um so if you've got really repetitive code not always straightforward to do but using functions can really help to tame it and check it and improve it so we're going to run through um an example i'm just going to to get started on some slides for now and then we'll switch back to our studio and I will I will be asking you to to do something with me in a minute if you if you're up for it so um maybe many of you are familiar with dplyr package and it's got this nice little data set built into it which you can once you've done library dplyr you've got access to star wars it tells you some stuff about a load of 87 characters from the first six Star Wars films, they haven't updated it for the, the more recent three. Okay, so that's what that looks like. 
Okay. Let's say um, we want to get, we want to find out what the average height of all the droids in Star Wars first six films is. So Star Wars, filter it, just get the, the ones where it's a droid and then let's do a, a summarize. This is all dplyr stuff. Um, create a, a sim single column out, which gives us the droid mean height. And I've put a remove NAs just in case. I don't think you can have a droid that doesn't have a height, but anyway, just in case there was some missing data. Um, there we go, there's our summary. So the mean height, I think this is centimeters. Mean height of all the droids in Star Wars, 131. That's pretty good. Okay, well, actually, do you know what my boss has just said? He really needs to know, or she really needs to know what's the average height of all the, the Ewoks. So um, I'm gonna copy that code and paste it and just change droid to Ewok, okay? I don't know what's mean height. Fine, filter species, summarize. Oh, okay. The Ewoks are shorter than the droids on average. That's probably to be expected. But um, have you noticed the semi-deliberate error here? Because I copied and pasted, I just changed one thing. I changed it to Ewok. I didn't actually change what I call my column. Maybe it doesn't matter. Still got the right answer, I hope. But you know, there was more than one thing to change there. So I'm now saying a droid mean height is 88, and that's not um, that's not what we want, right? We want it to say Ewok mean height. So let's try again. Okay, so I actually had to change two things. If I wanted my output uh, column, my summary column, to, uh, to have the right label. So this is one of the main things I want to achieve this morning is thinking about, okay, if we've got some repetitive code, how can we turn that into a function which is gonna help avoid those kind of copy and paste slips that we can get sometimes. You know, I might have ended up putting the wrong height for Ewoks into my uh, into my report then if I wasn't careful. Okay, so here's, here's the original code from the previous slide. The first step is just chuck it in the bag. We can, we can get rid of the output for now. Um, yeah, we can get rid of what that thing needs to be the, the, the result needs to be called, and we're just going to give the function a name, get species mean height, whatever, give it a nice descriptive name, I don't mind long names. And purely what I've done really is take the content of that upper piece of code, put it within the brackets, and there we go, I've got a function. It's even more exciting than those first functions we did at the start, right? We don't need to worry, there's no need or no point really in deciding what that output is going to be called within the function. It's not going to really make any difference. Um, when the user, when you, whoever the user of this function is, when they run it, they will decide what to do with that output. So we can ditch the bit that was in the original code that says what this, what object that's going to go to. I hope that makes sense. We don't need it in the function. It's just going to give us the output. really should have thought about sharing. Never mind. Back to our studio. Okay, so let's do some refactoring. Slightly, a situation slightly based on um, some, some code seen in the wild. Um, I'm going to restart again. It's not good. Alvin the chicken, fair enough. Um, sorry, bear with my eye decided to crash on me. Which does not happen very often. Okay. Hopefully that's working all right now. Okay. Slow D plier. Um, I'm just gonna do something a bit uh, cheeky on the side here and hope you don't notice. I'm gonna start setting a variable called film and create a whole new data set that has, uh, yeah, something a bit different around it. Okay. So here's some uh, example code. Yeah. I'm gonna use the Star Wars. Okay, we've now got a droid's mean height uh, tibble output um, purely based on 
any droids that were in A New Hope, the original Star Wars. Uh, does that look like 120? <laughs> okay. And let's say we want to do Ewoks, and I've remembered to rename my output column now, Ewoks Mean Height. And we've got, we've got an output there. I'm actually just going to delete the droids mean height for now from my from my environment. And this that just I'm just recapitulating now what we just did in the in the on the slide. So if I put all that in a function, but I keep the name of the output with the, uh, in the function still, let's create that function. It's got no, it's got no arguments, it's just going to do whatever's whatever's inside the curly brackets. It does it work as a function? Hmm. It looks like it's worked. We haven't got an error. It hasn't given us any output though, which is strange. Okay, and now I'm gonna try and find the output by, let's imagine I knew what was in the function. I knew that it was creating something called droids mean height. If you were a betting person, do you think droids mean height is gonna return anything? Well, you can see from my environment, that it's not there. Even though I thought I'd created it within the function, it hasn't given us that object. It hasn't given us that, that output, even though the function itself seemed to work. Okay, let's try explicitly allocating our output. So our, our, our summary table, we want that now to go into that variable, droids mean height. Cool. Okay, we've now got a function that seems to work. So we look at it, yeah. We're good. Um, actually, go on then, Jasper. <laughs> so, so where does R put the value it creates within the function? Because it's still doing the calculation when you run it. So mm -hmm. where, where is that going? That is such a good question. <laughs> it's almost like it's only got its meaning within the function. I think I'm a, I'm a little bit nervous saying that, actually, because I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm totally sure. All I can see is... When I run it, it doesn't give me what I expect. It hasn't created anything in the uh, in the outside world, as it were. I like the question. I'm a bit wary of saying stuff on YouTube that I haven't really understood. <laughs> maybe maybe we can work out maybe we can work out a better answer than that. My my feeling is that um, it kind of worked, but the art uh, the the output didn't go anywhere. Because I'm guessing that also means if you're gonna if you're gonna run a bunch of functions sequentially, you actually even mm. to run them together within the same function, rather than saying, "Well, I'll run an individual function, then try to run a second function based on the variables created within that first function if they've not been externally defined." Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, and this, this is where I think often you get things called wrapper functions, which are like nothing to do with wrap the process uh, it's like a wrapper around so you, all your functions are kind of working within a kind of shared environment as, as well um it can depend on your personal preference i prefer to have things within that function space if that makes sense rather than adding stuff to my global environment if i can help it um so i will i will bind i will combine multiple smaller functions within a bigger function, which enables them to sort of talk to each other. Okay. Makes sense. But yeah. There's a, there's a bit of trial and error around that, I think, for me sometimes. Still, um, I'm going to do re delete that again, just because we don't want it in the way. So this time, if we don't specify uh, the the output kind of within the function, we don't, we don't need to do that. So let's take it out. We've now just got... Our process starts with the data frame. Um, actually, that was two cells too. Uh, and does the stuff. So, like you were saying earlier, you know, you can you can definitely work with with data frames. Okay. We're now going to regenerate that function, and this time, if we run it, we actually get an output at the console. It's almost like <laughs> this is going to ruin my earlier metaphor now, but it's almost like we've got a hole in the bottom of our carrier bag. The output's just fallen through. And it's come out into the global environment as a, by default. So our data's come out. It's given us that response, the, the tibble. It's an, and it's kind. Of, we've in a way we've kind of lost it. It's it's been it's been echoed in the console, but we haven't got any handle on it. We haven't got a name for it. 
so let's give it this is this feels very um groundhog day actually because it didn't say anything again but let's now give it a name it's now an object in the environment we can see it and we we've we've got it so the names is really important if you want to hang on to your output if you want your functions to be usable obviously you need to name them things just just the same as any other uh, object okay so this is the bit where i want to um get you to do a bit of help for me so let's just move these uh bits of code down here okay this is what i'm looking at what are the things that vary between those chunks and and whatever varies we would want to um either put as a function argument or actually sometimes ask do i really need them to be different so i'm going to open the floor <laughs> Hopefully this is not rocket science, but tell me, tell me one thing at least that's different in those two um, paragraphs of, of, of code. Species. Yeah, yeah, the name of the species, sure. Yeah. So we can go back and get our function. And this time, let's move species into a, an argument to the function. Okay, um, I probably don't want to call it species, really. I, I kind of don't like the it being the same thing as what it's actually called in the data frame. Um, my species. Okay, so now my function, Fenella is standing at the door of my warehouse and going, okay, I'm expecting something called my species. Um, where am I going to put that in the function? What am I going to replace? with the variable my species. I say the word droid, right? Because that's the bit we need to change. That's the bit that's different on each one. Um, so I'm just gonna leave it there for now and we'll try that. <laughs> live coding, eh, live coding. It's a test of whether I know what I'm talking about. So this time, what, what do I need to put in if I want the droid mean height? What do I need to enter into my function argument, do you think? My species equals droid. Yeah. Thank you. Or in fact, I could leave that off, but let's do it this way for now. So I need the quotes because it's a character. And hopefully, yeah, that worked. So it took that input we gave it, Droid, it replaced it within the function. It kind of said, okay, what's under the mask? And, and did the summary. Can we, um, let's just try something. I can't think of any other species right now, so I'm gonna to stick to, oh, let's do human. I don't think humans really exist in Star Wars, but they do in the database. So yeah, okay, that works. So we can try adding different things. And we've got the same bit of code, it's functioning, It's functioning it's working on different inputs we might give it something that doesn't exist and it might give us a, an empty answer or an error um okay do can we think of something else we might want to adjust in um in our function here get species mean height can you change the droid mean height to be a paste of my species comma mean height you can so yeah. at least have a clear understanding of what's being kicked out. You certainly can. I'm going to leave that for now because I feel like, A, I'll probably get it wrong. But there is totally a way of doing that. So, yes, it would call the output column what something, depending what the, your species is. For now, just to try and keep things simple, and because I think that's a whole other world where you start getting into... Um, pasting blue variables into column names and things, and you have to do strange syntax. What I'm going to do just to simplify things is just say, I'm going to call that column mean height, no matter what input, personal preference. Yeah, as you say, there is a way of doing it so that it would rename that column something, depending what you what you pass in. Um, but yeah, that should still work. I think then what I'm, what I'm thinking, if someone writes this function wanting to use it, is that I'm going to... 
um, perhaps use my object name, use my output object name to, to tell me what, what's going on. Okay. But you know, you can definitely get more complex with functions, but that seems to have worked. Oh, not a number. Ooh. Oh, because there's no Ewoks in A New Hope, of course. Obviously. <laughs> We, we've got a filtered version of, of the Star Wars data set, so it doesn't like that, but it didn't, it, the function didn't fail, it's just that there wasn't any data to work, to, to create a mean, I'm thinking that's what, I'm thinking that's what's happened. Okay, everyone with me, everyone all right, has everyone got a cup of tea <laughs> um, and enjoying themselves? I am. Okay, let's see something different. So this is something you might see in the wild, okay? Um, I'm going to uncomment this stuff. Let's say, um, do you know what? My um, my boss who's come to me and said, oh, we've made a mistake. It wasn't a new hope that we needed that data for. It was actually for Force Awakens. Uh, uh, can you do, or can you do both? Or can you do me this data for, for all of the films? Uh, thank you. So we might then go, all right, I'll change my film variable. Create that data set again if you like, it's like there's gonna be a different data set now because we've changed the value of film. And then I'm gonna get my um, my nice little function. I don't need to move it actually, I've already got it. Let's just check that it's there. And um, let's see. Oh, that was stupid, wasn't it? <laughs> I forgot to rename my variable human data. Okay, 167 centimeters in The Force Awakens. So there's a, I'm just, just gonna stop very briefly and just look at the chat in case. Oh, thanks Zoe, yeah. Um, I wonder if we can make our function even funkier and do something with the, the film variable as well. So instead of physically kind of manually going, changing the variable, running it again. Maybe we can actually bind those two things together and make one great big function. So feel free to tap away and do this in your own our studio if you've, if you've got it open. Um, have, a, have a little play. I'm gonna take a breath for two mins. Get this um, function, maybe make a, a new copy of it, maybe call it something different because you're gonna include film now. Um, if you go back up to the top, there's the code up here, which shows one way at least of filtering the data down to a, depending on what the film is, okay. Um, you might say, well, actually I want it to work for all films, in the whole database. Can you build in a new version, a new hope, a new version of this function that not only gives you an option to specify spe uh, whatever species it is, but also specify what film um, you want to get the data from. I'll let you do that for two, three minutes and see what comes up, see if it works. If you feel like, I, can, um, I don't know if I can get people to share screens, but it'd be nice if people get something nice and want to show it off. Um, as I say, I'm gonna take a breath for two minutes and just let you have a have a play and, and, and see if it's see if it works, see if it's straightforward, see if you get a bit a bit stuck. Remember, you're just putting the code in the carrier bag. Kind of. To 11. Thanks. So we just had a fun time playing with um, Jasper's function, which looked fine to me, but wasn't giving what expected answer. In a, it was working, it just didn't give us a number. Um, and so my homework or anyone's homework is to uh, work out what, what went wrong there. So just to summarize what we've been doing, we're saying like, if you have some input, let's call it a data frame and you kind of doing the same sort of step multiple times, you know, I'm, I'm going to process it and I want to know the result for droids and I want to know the result for Ewoks. And, Maybe I only want to know um, for certain a certain film or certain films. 
use in a way you can save yourself the repetition and you can actually tr fix problems in one place only if you're if you turn it into a function chuck it in the carrier bag and um and work from there so we can spot efficiencies we can make uh, make our life simpler by only maintaining one piece of code rather than five or six or whatever it makes us it kind of makes us clear what the inputs and outputs ought to be and that comes back to that idea of pure functions you know am i relying on something being present in my global environment or am i actually making sure that i input everything into my function that it needs um not not a topic for today but quite often with functions you know if you're doing some important work semi-important work you can have assertion checks at the start to say um you know i want to test i want to check that um the, the film value is belongs to one of the um expected values or i want to check that it's a character or i want to check that i don't know you know that, that, that this is what i'm expecting something to be supplied as a number that it is actually a number things like that um you can do tests on the output before it can goes back you know have i have I got the kind of output I'm ready to re to return back from the function? One other nice thing about functions, again, out of scope for today, but there are these other helper functions. So there's something called LApply in base, or there's the um, tidyverse equivalent of that called map, which let's say you had a, a vector, you know, and you create a vector of, uh, we're using C bracket, then you could say C Ewok, comma, droid, comma, human, comma, all the other bizarre species, and, and then pass your function to that vector and it will go through them one by one and do your function for you. So you, this is a really nice way. It's kind of like creating a, creating a list of outputs. Um, that's again, a topic for another day. So as I said at the start, when I first tried writing functions, I went through absolute, um, nightmare trying to understand and what is it and I think one of the main things as I said for me was the difference between what you call something inside the function um, and what you what it's called when you su supply it so you can have things like the function could be expecting x equals x and I just think what what's the point why can't I just give it the value what's the point in using a variable I actually didn't know anything about programming because um, using variables is kind of like an essential part of that but eventually I just didn't get the point, like, well, how is this helping me? I'm just writing more stuff that's more complicated and I'm creating abstractions when I'd rather just stick to what I know. Um, it doesn't matter, I don't care if I'm pasting something five times and changing a line in each, each time. Um, but eventually, you know, I realized the sort of power of that abstraction, the blocks kind of clicked together for me and I, I now I just use them all the time. It means your code works harder for you you can transfer it, you can use it in different situations, you can get it to work with different inputs and so on. And so you, functions are really useful for us as data scientists. Um, Hadley Wickham and co, who I'm not gonna argue with in their, their book uh, for data science, naming things is really useful because sometimes you revisit your code. I was talking earlier about, you know, being kind to your future self. You, you reopen a project that you last touched six months ago and it does things and you think, what, why is it doing those things? What's, what's this for? And actually just naming is a skill in itself and giving your functions like a really evocative name that summarizes what it is they're doing. Um, just makes your code easier to work with. Um, you can put it in comments for sure. Just if you're working with a standard sort of script of I, you can, you can do that. But names are really useful, particularly when you're transferring things around using functions in different contexts. Um, yeah, like I said, some, you know, someone comes back to you and says, actually, we need to do this analysis slightly differently. Um, we need to put in uh, some sort of exclusion. You know, we now need to put in an extra filter line or something. You've only got to change it in one place. You fix it in the filter, in the function, sorry. You run the function again. You've only, you've only done that work once. Um, remember a few slides back when I did that copy paste thing and I thought, oh, I haven't updated the output column name, you know? When we copy and paste, we really open ourselves up to little incidental mistakes, which can actually be quite, create quite a lot of problems in working with data. So I think functions help us, Hadley says, eliminate the chance. I mean, in a way you do, yeah. If your function's right and you use it, 
then you eliminate that copy and paste um, issue. And yeah, it can make us more, um, it, it, we, can, we can take, take our functions from project to, to project and, and increase our productivity. So, and that comes from the R for Data Science book, which I've linked here. And um, that's that same text again. And I realized that you could um, summarize these points. I could say, functions help us do our jobs well. They help us with naming, they help us with efficiency, they help us with accuracy, and they help us with transferability. And I think that's quite neat. Um, if you look at that, that is there. Um, yes, basically we're, we're there. Um, I've put just a couple of resources in if I think of others, or if you want to suggest other things that you found useful, um, let me know and I can up update the, uh, the project. And there's some recommendations on naming functions in a, in a sort of, it's like a work in progress sort of online book that I think Hadley Wickham in, uh, from Tidyverse is um, writing maybe with other people as well. That's kind of explains a lot of the design decisions that they've used in the main Tidyverse packages, Dplyr and all the rest um, on how things are structured, how functions are built, how they decide what order to put their function arguments in and that kind of thing, how they deal with default values and lots of other things. And they've got some nice recommendations on, on naming functions, because as I said earlier, that's where I get stuck. I just cannot be bothered to think of another name. So yeah, lots of things we haven't covered today. Um, the detail of like, should I put all these things in one big function or should I have lots of shorter functions? I think there's, I think there's pros and cons on both sides for me personally, but I can, yeah, I think starting, tending towards shorter is probably good. Easier to debug for sure. Um, I haven't really talked about those assertion checks that I mentioned, you know, checking that arguments are in the format and the type that you want them to be. The whole other um, session you could have on, on passing functions to other functions using map and things like that. Using anonymous functions. So that um, backslash format that I used right at the start, backslash, you know, that could be really nice if you just need a throwaway function. Um, let's say you're you're creating a new column in your data frame with mutate and you just need to pass a little function to one column and get it to create a new column. Um, that shorthand thing is, 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 is a really nice way of um, keeping, that, keeping that kind of code nice and concise. A really big topic of writing tests. Again, the, the simpler your function is, the kind of easier it is to test. Testing is a really important thing when you're writing packages that other people might be using. That's a whole other topic. And then, yeah, if you've got functions that you're gonna use again and again, why not put them in a package? And there's lots of really useful um, functions in a package called use this, which I think Zoe uh, plugs quite often. Um, and that can really help with building a package. Again, when I first tried, I just thought this is silly. I cannot, cannot think of any reason why I would need to build a package. I'm not that kind of person. You know, I'm not that, I'm not inclined that way. But again, eventually it clicked and I thought, oh, do you know what? This is really useful to learn how to build a package um, in R. So yeah, that's again, a topic for another day. And for now, thank you very much for participating and attending and for all the, yeah, being along for the ride. And that's, that's it. Thank you, that was useful. I've only just started really using functions the last like couple of weeks, so it was, and I've just been looking at random stuff online, so it's useful to actually have a bit of a little mini refresh, like from a really simple point of view, it's good. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I have a question. Yeah, go for it. So, it's like using the example of the like the mean height thing, mm. what if you wanna, what if you want the the column height to also be an argument so maybe you want to get the mean age or the mean you know whatever how it's, do you I really struggle with that that's like one of the things that, that I can't that you know you're saying it's taking you a while to took you a while to get your head around stuff yeah that like using column names as arguments yeah I'm struggling with yeah so simple way to do it 
it always works. <laughs> it's one of those things yeah, there is absolutely a way to do it. And it's, a, it's one of those things where, again, if it clicks, you just go, oh, yeah, I can do that. And uh, but I remember struggling with it myself quite a while because I think the way to do it is I think so we might have mentioned in the chat earlier. There's like a um, sort of glue way of doing it. I'm not sure if it was for that topic. You can use a curly bracket to wrap your variable in the name. And I'm not going to try and write that. Well, maybe I should try and write that code in front of us now, but it'll probably go wrong. <laughs> um, let's have a go. Why not? Yeah, if you wouldn't mind, that would be really helpful. If someone's discovered why this wasn't working. Films? I think it was an S. Yeah. I haven't been following along, so my my environment's all clear. I, and stuff. I'm just going to try and make this work, and then I'll see if we can um, you don't need do the, the thing that Emily's asking about. Yeah, you don't need the unnest longer. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, it's clever, and so you wouldn't need your DF either. You know, your DF function, or maybe you do. I think this is going to not working because I'm doing this stuff. Yeah, okay, I'm going back to normal Star Wars. Yes. Normal Star Wars. I was being a bit over over normal complicated. So if we... You're under pressure. Don't worry. <laughs> under pressure of if we control. wanted to change the output column, I'm going to just <gasps> see if this works. Um, hold on. It's going to be mean. I've got to put it in quotes. Make it a character. What are we doing? Um, you know, let's do it as a Z. I think we need a special equals. So Z, let's say Z is going to be our, what it is, the column we want to do the mean of. Yeah. I think this isn't. I suspect this isn't going to work because I've forgotten something important. But let's see if it likes that. And now I can never remember whether it needs to be quoted or not. Got a lot of arguments now. No, that's got to be quoted because it's not an object we know about. If someone knows how to do this, then shout because it's, it's actually not that complicated, but doing it live, I'm, <laughs> I'm fairly sure that I've got the first bit. Right, so those single curly brackets will say whatever that variable is, put it in here. Maybe I don't need the colon. I think I do. So what does the colon do? <laughs> Brain fade. Brain fade. It's when you have something complex before the equals. Because normally that would need to be a okay. simple, wouldn't it? You'd normally have to do something unquoted like um the hype, you know? Yeah. You do the quoted bit. Let's keep it simple for now. Ah, okay. Let's do this. I don't like dollar signs, but let's try that. I think it doesn't know what Z is unless I make it important that it's part of the data. Shoot. <laughs> uh, and then I'm size Yeah. I know, I know. I don't know. I'm going to guess again. This is what I've just been trying to do when you ask yeah. me what I'm doing before. This is oh, what I'm doing. Yes. <laughs> Victory. Okay. So that's why okay. I don't like dollar signs because actually, if you do DF dollar Z, uh, for me, it doesn't work. When you use the right. normal brackets, it means you can put a string, a character in as the column title. Okay. I think that's worked. And I didn't need the colon equals either. Well, you still called it mean Z rather than mean um, height. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, good That point. needs to be paste the, or glue, doesn't it, that bit? So you would yeah. use the glue package. Yeah. Mean and then the name. But that should work. There we go. Oh, it does. I, needed the, I did need the colon. Colon equals. Okay. 
All right, cool. But that, that, what Thank it does is it uses glue by default if you use those curly brackets. That's been, that's been in R for, in, in Dplyr for a couple of versions. I'm chuffed with that. Yeah, that's <laughs> cool. Thank you. That's Something cool. like that. Wow. I'm not sure that's totally the smoothest, neatest way of doing it, but I think it works. Can you paste it in the chat, please? Yeah. <laughs> so for the benefit of the recording, that symbol of the colon and the equals is called the walrus. The walrus. And Dre mentioned it, and I was like, oh, the name stuck, but I didn't it's know the why. Long, the long teeth. So you I look looked for it. And it's yeah. called non-standard evaluation and walrus operator and curly curly. I've yeah. pasted something. I was going to say, there's a really good link about it out there somewhere. Oh, that's saying yeah. how you do it. So it's about tidy evaluation. Yeah. It's gone really like advanced in this. Yeah. No, it's a great question, though, Emily, because that is exactly you know I I said earlier oh, we won't bother with that today. It's out of scope, but it's one of the things that does prevent people from using a function. It's like well, actually, I do need that bit to change. But I can't work out how to make it change. So that's that's totally I think that's actually in scope today completely. Thank you, Zoe. That that link in the chat is, is perfect. Hey everybody, I will stop recording. We can keep the talking afterwards, but just so you can do that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish on a victorious note, right? <laughs> yeah. Five minutes, but we got there. <laughs>